No one can really remember how many years ago it was before most of them were here again. It's in the 20s. I was here. They were fun last time. They're absolutely fantastic tonight. Here they are. David Hardman. Headlines in the newsreels. It would be good to hear some of the background stuff. Oh, here I am. Oh. I'm late. I'm late. Hey, that is a tough act to follow, the Blue Angels. <laughs> Holy cow. Anyway, good evening, everybody. Uh, to start our Apollo evening, um, attention to the big screen, please. And here's a little backgrounder on the space program from the 1960s. If you want to watch the screen. I can see it from here. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, this. but because they are hard. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for man. Yeah, we've had a problem here. Can say again, please? Oh, uh, here's what we've had a problem. Stand by at 13, we're looking at it. used to having thousands of man-made satellites zooming around our planet. About 1,100 of them are active now. But until 1957, there was no such thing as a man-made satellite. That's when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, they called it, into orbit. It was 184 pounds, a little bigger than a beach ball, and as it zoomed around the Earth, all it did was beep, and that beep told the world, we, the Soviets, are first in space, and we beat the United States in getting there. Then four years later, in 1961, the Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human to orbit the Earth. And one month later, Alan Shepard became the first American in space. The space race was on. In April 1961, just a few months after he was inaugurated, President Kennedy challenged America. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. One of the original astronauts, Wally Schirra, was fond of saying, quote, the most important part of the president's statement was returning him safely to Earth, end quote. At the time, it seemed impossible to get to the moon, but the entire country was behind it, and the United States ramped up fast. There were three programs, six one-man flights called Mercury, then ten two-man flights called Gemini, and finally eleven three-man flights called Apollo. Each flight had new challenges and unknowns, and each flight built on the knowledge learned from the earlier flights. Just eight and a half years after the Kennedy challenge, Neil Armstrong became the first human to walk on the moon. There were 30 Apollo astronauts, 12 of them walked on the moon. Most agree that this was the greatest single scientific human achievement in history. 
It was accomplished by hundreds of thousands of dedicated Americans, patriots, brilliant engineers, scientists and managers, academics and technicians, and of course, risk-taking aviator astronauts. Odyssey Houston standing by, over. Odyssey Houston, we show you on the main. It really looks great. Ah, oh, under Apollo 13, this is recovery, and your shoes will look good. So welcome our panelists. Our first guest tonight is actually the only one who's not an astronaut. Aerospace engineer, a retired Air Force F-86 pilot, flight director and manager for Gemini and most of the Apollo flights. He is a huge part and the heart and the soul of the space program. Welcome Gene Kranz. Next, he's a marine fighter pilot and physicist. Worked for many years as a civilian at the RAND Corporation. Apollo 7, the first manned Apollo flight. Retired Marine Colonel Walt Cunningham. Annapolis graduate, naval aviator, attack pilot, test pilot, flew two Gemini missions and two Apollo missions, retired Navy captain, Jim Lovell. West Point graduate, Air Force fighter pilot, test pilot, master's degree in aeronautical engineering, flew Gemini 7 and Apollo 8, Air Force retired colonel, Frank Borman. <laughs> Air Force and Navy, fighter pilot, both engineer, research test pilot for NASA, flew Apollo 13, Fred Hayes. Another West Point graduate, Air Force fighter pilot, has a PhD from MIT in astronautics, flew Gemini 12 and Apollo 11, Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> Air Force fighter pilot flew the F-100 and went to the test pilot school at Edwards. He is the youngest American astronaut flying the X-15 at age 32. He was backup crews for two Apollo flights, but also flew CAP Commander 2 STS uh, shuttle missions and is the only shuttle commander to pilot the shuttle from orbit to full stop landing at Edwards manually. This is retired Major General Joe Engel.
You outrank everybody. <laughs> and the poor guys whose name, last name, ends in W get stuck all the time. Darn it. West Point graduate, graduate engineer, degrees, interceptor, test pilot, flew Apollo 15, a retired Air Force colonel, Al Worden. Al? Yeah. Oh, we got too many chairs here. So you know what? Maybe we can spread out. Yeah, we. Yeah, spread out a little bit. It looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Wait. You can separate. So. You know, if you like the guy next to you, you can sit next to him. If not, you can. You know. <laughs> Gene, sitting down at the far end there, start us off, would you? You know, we see so many uh, newsreel, you know, the highlights of all the Apollo and all the Gemini missions, but we never or rarely talk about what it takes to get to become an astronaut. We hear some of the background, but Gene, criteria, what kind of criteria? I mean, they're all great aviators to begin with, but what is... What is NASA looking for besides great pilots? Well, I think the first thing they want to do is uh, find one of these uh, astronauts that are going to respond to a flight director. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, if that doesn't work, I turn the surgeon on them. <laughs> but, you know, but actually, actually the, uh, the training process in the early days was very interesting. You have to really uh, go back into the late 50s, early 60s, and uh, address how did we how did we train the crews? How did we train the controllers? You know the uh, simulator that the Mercury astronauts had was basically what you would say a procedures trainer. It had basically a series of switches in there that represented the, what's inside the cockpit, and basically they provided an indication when they're flipped to an instructor at the console. So this was basically a procedures trainer. There was virtually nothing that you could do related to the mission except for the crew to follow the flight plan. Uh, the instructor at the console would do this. In the meantime, in Mercury Control, basically we had a, what we call a sim soup. It was very early days. And as the spacecraft would theoretically go around the world, various trace sites would have seen it, he'd run around and pass his pieces of paper out. And it'd go to the surgeon that says, uh, your astronaut just had a heart attack. And we try to surgeon would now fake it. What would he do if he had a sick astronaut in orbit? So basically the uh, uh, process was extremely rudimentary. It was uh, typical, I think, of the uh, early jet fighters they had in there where basically you spent a lot of time in a cockpit and basically you got your flight plan, you knew your procedures, and you uh, basically applied the throttle and started moving forward. So that was, that was Mercury. Uh, Walt, um, even though you're all, you're all pilots, in terms of training, you're a Marine, so you went through particularly difficult early training, I assume. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Yes, sir. Understood. Um, but how was the training process for you, given what you would already been through in training, um, for you to become an astronaut to be accepted? Well, back in the days when I was flying, at the time I came to NASA, I was flying with the reserves because I decided I ought to go to college when I was 24 years old. So I was started college there, and I was flying with the reserves. And uh, I don't think I, with this audience, I ought to give exactly my reaction when I was listening to uh, Alan Shepard's first liftoff. But uh, I wanted to be a, a fighter pilot, which I was felt quite successful at being. and. Uh, it was after Alan Shepard's first liftoff, May 5th, 1961. And, uh, well, I will tell the story. Uh, at that time, I was uh, working half-time at the Rand Corporation, going to UCLA, lived in Canoga Park, had to go over to Santa Monica every morning because I was trying to earn a living. Uh, back in those days, we did not get free college and all that. Ooh. And uh, I was listening, it was a little before 7, I was listening to the countdown of uh, the first Mercury mission. And when it got down to the last five minutes, I could not 
go any farther. I pulled over and parked at the side of the road on Mulholland Drive. And I'll never forget, got down to three, two, one, lift off. And I heard, heard this voice screaming out here, you lucky, well, SOB. I, I just cut it short. And I was, first I was looking around to see who it was, and I realized it was me <laughs> doing that screaming. And that was when I decided what I was going to be trying to do. And two years later, I was, uh, I was sharing, two and a half years later, I was sharing an office with Alan Shepard. Wow. wow. Frank Borman, Frank Man, how was, how was the training process for you uh, once you were selected as an astronaut um, to be then selected to actually fly? How tough was the process, or not? Well, it, was, it really wasn't that difficult, but it was uh, involved an awful lot of learning. We spent, uh, uh, it, you hear me now? It, we, we, uh, we spent an awful lot of time at the different factories, and uh, we went to uh, academic courses and so on, but it was, it was uh, basically a, a, a course in immersing yourself in a new, a new industry. At least uh, for me, it was new rockets. I don't know if you guys have been around rockets before. I never had been around them. Right. So, Al, even though you got W, right? I'm always last. Yeah, you poor guy. Um, right. But W, how was the process for you in adapting after the flying career? Um, it really wasn't a very big transition. I was uh, teaching at the test pilot school at Edwards. I had gone through the Empire Test Pilot School in England. Um, I w worked for a guy by the name of Chuck Yeager, uh, who is a rather interesting individual. Um, and uh, Bob Buchanan was the uh, deputy, uh, and uh, Jay Hanks, Norris Hanks, was the head of academics there. Uh, when I got selected into the program, oh, I have to tell you, the first thing that happened is that I got assigned to Wally Schirra. And uh, while he was a captain in the Navy and I was a captain in the Air Force, and I went in and, and let him know that we were both captains, and so I really didn't have to worry about what he had to say. And, and, and I, found out, I, f I found out that I was very quickly sweeping his floor and getting him coffee, uh, because, because that's what happens to greenies. That's what happens to newbies at, uh, in, down in Houston. Uh, we, we weren't worth much until we made a flight. Uh, but I didn't see a lot of transition for me because one of the first things we did was we got checked out in T-38, so we started flying. And then we went through a classroom session of about six months. And after that, got signed to an engineering program uh, on Apollo 9. And, of course, when we had the fire at the Cape, I was on the recovery engineering group at the manufacturer. And so there was a lot of engineering to do, and that would have been the kind of engineering I would have done anywhere. So it was only after all of that that I really saw some differences. Uh, I got assigned to uh, Apollo 12 backup and then Apollo 15 prime crew, and it was uh, quite different. Well, Gene Kranz, I, in, the, in the video, uh, I talked about the fact that each mission was built on the successes and lessons learned from the mission before. How much was learned from Mercury leading into Gemini, and how successful was that process to get to the two-man flights in Gemini? I think the transition was uh, relatively smooth. We had experienced crews coming out of the Mercury program that generally were the mission commanders, the commanders that moved into the Gemini program. So then they moved the back of some of the newer astronauts in there. By this time, however, the simulation process had really expanded almost exponentially. We had basically systems that could fully represent uh, the spacecraft systems. We had basically computers a very simple computer on board the Gemini spacecraft, about a 4K machine. But basically, this now provided the astronauts information as to some of the things that were happening to them once they got on orbit. Uh, I believe that the, uh, the real breakthrough in training occurred during the process of simulation, because now we had an instrument that would basically complement the classroom and the learn by doing, because we all spent a lot of time in the factories, uh, working the procedures, down at the Cape with range safety and all that. So basically, it was a combination of learn by doing, okay, and then it, take that and apply it 
during the simulation training process you had? So those first Gemini missions, including Ed White, what was that, Gemini 4? Gemini 4. 4 was the first EVA. But those first few Gemini missions, how successful were they uh, leading up to what we're going to talk about in a moment with Gemini 7? Well, Gemini 4 was the uh, EVA I wrote the uh, procedures. Actually, uh, I got a call because that was my first mission as flight director. And uh, Kraft called up and says, are you ready for your flight director? He says, yeah. He says, that's good. He says, because we'd like to do an EVA. Ed White's been in training over in the uh, uh, laboratories over there with some of the equipment they had. And what I want you to do is go over and basically get fully knowledgeable of the equipment he's using, what are the tasks he's trying to do, what are the kinds of limitations they got when you apply it within the spacecraft. Uh, and basically it was just to sit down and talk yourself through what you were trying to do and then try to translate that into procedures. We had a marvelous crew systems division with absolutely superb engineers that were providing the hardware. So again, it was one of these things, you know, at that time, risk was virtually everything we did, but basically we became adept and good managers of the process of the missions we flew in basically controlling the risk associated. What happened with six that led to seven with that Frank and Jim flew? What happened with six that, that allowed seven to happen? Frank or Jim, you want to grab that? Jim? Well, of course, what happened to six that uh, uh, permitted a lot of different things to happen, which was sometimes the way to go was the fact that six was all set to do the first rendezvous. And uh, the it was, uh, uh, what was it? it was, uh, oh, it was uh, uh, Frank, no. Gina. Well, uh, Gina, but who was in the sixth? The puzzle? Stafford and Shaw, that's right. Stafford and. I apologize when I'm just getting old. <laughs> We're the same age. Anyway, uh, with Stafford and Schwab were going up at six. And, uh, uh, and the Gina was launched, the Gina was lost, and so uh, they had to recycle. And here's where good management came into play. Uh, seven was gonna be a two-week mission. <clears throat> so can we recycle Apollo or Gemini 6 to go rendezvous with seven? Now, seven did not have a docking uh, device on it, but can we just, you know, prove out the rendezvous? So that's exactly what they did. We were up for about uh, eight days, I think, at the time. And then, then there was a second attempt to launch, and uh, the engines ignited uh, on, on the vehicle and then shut down right away. Fortunately, uh, Wally Schwab was a little slow in doing the aborts, and, <laughs> and consequently, everything was fine. And so I think on day 12 of our flight, uh, six took off and did the rendezvous. And so we accomplished that rendezvous uh, by good management and, and seeing how we can get uh, Gemini 6 up with 7. You notice that Frank and Jim are sitting next to each other. They broke the record at the time for length of time in orbit, and that was Frank and Jim together in Gemini 7. And Frank, how, like how was know, Fort? I would, I would like to know. How many people in the audience would like to spend 14 days in a volume as small as the front seat of a Volkswagen Beetle with a sailor? I know plenty. <laughs> So guys, describe what those 14 days were like. Togetherness takes on a new meaning, perhaps. Well, as a matter of fact, we got down after 14 days, and we we're on the uh, carrier. The first thing we did, we looked at each other, and we said, we just wanted to announce our engagement. <laughs> <laughs> What did the frogmen say when they opened the hatch? Well, the, uh, the, it, it was pretty.
pretty smelly in there. There's no question about it. But uh, Jim and I didn't notice it because we, we'd gotten used to it and it was fine. But, but the one thing he didn't mention, I do remember, Jim, that, that we sang one song for 14 days. One song. One song. Let's pretend that we're all together, all alone. You remember that Jim Reeves song? Put your sweet lips a little... I didn't know he was transgender at that time. <laughs> You soon found out. <laughs> you know, we, it, it's kind of interesting to get two people so close together and no place to go, no way to move out, that uh, I think either I or Frank lost the toothbrush. It didn't make any difference. We used the same toothbrush for 14 days. <laughs> so the mission was a success in more ways than one. <laughs> I th it's, it was beginning to sound like a Get Shira night, but maybe it's going to turn into, into something else at, at this point. Um, Gene Cernan did an EVA. Um, before too long, in what, which Gemini was Gene? Ten? What? Nine? Nine. And uh, how did that go, Gene? Or who wants to grab that? It was I a think tough Serta described it properly. He says that was the EVA from hell. Yeah. So as a result of, of Gene's experience, which he used to rest his soul, um, his description of it really told that story and how difficult it was. But that, that was a message to leadership, right, that something had to be done. Well, the uh, key thing was one of the, first of all, the tasks they laid out really didn't fit the experience level that we had in EVA by that time, first of all. Second thing is they had not established the anti-fog compounds they needed to clean that visor because he was virtually flying blind for the best part of the EVA. And the third thing was is that we probably should have uh, looked uh, better at the exterior spacecraft because this traverse path back into the cockpit was a lot tighter than we thought. So basically, it was, uh, there was a very strong learning, but unfortunately, we did not really use what we had learned in the 10 and 11 mission. It was only when we got to 12 right. that we really understood the nature of EVA and learned to train the crews in the neutral buoyancy environment. So Jim, that was your commanding a second flight. That was your second flight, but Buzz, you were the guy that was training to do that next EVA. What was the training process to make your flight a better one, your EVA a better one than what Gene had? Well, I'll yeah. start, but I'll let Buzz finish. Uh, there's three, essentially three. You uh, stayed in the spacecraft. There, there are th there's three essential uh, failures. Uh, nine tried. Uh, we didn't understand uh, Newton's third law of motion. To every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, which meant that every time that the astronaut got near a big vehicle like the uh, Gemini, since we were neutralized in Earth's gravity, uh, it reacted. And so uh, essentially what happened to Gene Cernan was he got overheated, he got he was really tired to do it, and uh, this also happened in 10, Apollo 10 and Apollo 11. And then there was the, I mean Gemini, I'm sorry, not Apollo. Gemini 10 and 11. And then there was a fellow, I don't know where it came from. He said, why don't we use water immersion uh, to simulate zero gravity. And so on Gemini 12, and I'll let Buzz tell the rest of the story because he's the one that actually in a boy's pool in Baltimore, we were able to uh, sink a simulation of the spacecraft and we put Buzz in a space suit, which could be just as well underwater as it is in space. We made him neutrally buoyant. We said, D Buzz, don't, don't try to swim. And then we went down and looked at uh, various handholds and uh, footholds. And, but uh, Buzz did all that work to come up and, and make uh, Gemini 12 successful. So Buzz, what was that training like for you? Well, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, you hearing me okay? Yeah, yeah. fine. 
I'm glad that Jim uh, gave us all the preliminaries all about EVA, you know. Uh, now this uh, maneuvering unit, the uh, AMU, it was the number one Air Force experiment on the whole program. And the crew that was originally going to fly on Gemini 9 was commanded by uh, Elliot C., a civilian uh, General Electric uh, test pilot, and uh, perhaps one of the best Air Force test pilots we had, Charlie Bassett, my backdoor neighbor. So an Air Force person was going to fly the number one Air Force experiment. Well, unfortunately, that crew uh, went into St. Louis on the snowstorm, and uh, they crashed into their hangar where their spacecraft was, and both of them were killed. My backdoor neighbor. So the backup crew uh, took over, and now we have, uh, instead of an Air Force test pilot going to fly the Air Force number one experiment, now we have a Navy test pilot who's going to fly the number one Air Force experiment. Now, this is the way you should have told it, Jim. <laughs> <coughs> from the Navy. <laughs> now, when some Jeez. engineers in Baltimore decided that uh, yeah. it would be a good idea maybe to train in a different way, and a few of you, you test pilots uh, said, well, how in the world can you simulate being in a vacuum up there by being underwater, you know, moving around. Well, see, I'd been scuba diving for eight or nine years at the time, and, and I really felt that this was going to work, and it really did. <coughs> and, and we did a lot of good training. I can remember uh, standing in the pool, you need a time waist time. deep, seeing uh, Gemini 11 lift off. You don't remember that? Well, where were you? You were supposed to be there with me. <laughs> no, he was watching me, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, Gemini 11's uh, rendezvous didn't, didn't go too well either. So the pressure really was sort of on us, the last flight uh, now, the four me main missions of the whole Gemini program were long duration space flight, computer uh, guided re entry, rendezvous in space, and spacewalking so that we would know how to do things out on the lunar surface. And I had done a little bit of studying about uh, rendezvous. Uh, as a matter of fact, while I was at MIT, I got a call from Ed White, who I'd known from West Point. We were in the same fighter squadron. <clears throat> and he said, you know, I've been through the test pilot school, got a master's degree, I'm testing airplanes. And he said, I'm gonna volunteer for this second selection process of astronauts. This was well, in 62. The was uh, EVA I know. how did we solve that problem? Well, I'm, I'm getting to it. And using water immersion. Because Ed said, I'm qualified. And I said, well, OK, so I haven't been through the test pilot but school, but I'm doing some pretty interesting things up here at, at MIT. Now, uh, Buzz, I was I, picked in the third group. Now, I show up in this program with all these experts, and I happen to get involved in the training of some of the astronauts, Wally Giraffe, 
and Tom Stafford and some others for the early rendezvous flights. So I remember uh, having a conversation with Deke Slayton. I said, you know, I would really like to be uh, along on one of these rendezvous flights in the Gemini program. And, and when you ask Deke Slayton, Slayton something, you don't get an answer right away. He, so I went out. And the next thing I know, Jim Lovell and I are assigned to the backup crew on Gemini 10, which means that they have, when that one flies, they have a crew for 11 and 12, so we were going to be prime crew on Gemini 13. There is no 13, so Buzz was not going to fly in the Gemini program until there was a tragedy. My backdoor neighbor. And so Good we buzz. backed up nine, and then we became prime crew on Buzz, buzz, buzz. What were you, what were, in the EVA, problem. what were you able to do in the EVA in 12 that Gene was not able to do in nine? Well, we had excellent uh, foot restraints by this time. I mean, you could put your foot in the foot restraint and, and there was just no getting out of it. You could take one foot back and lean over, and you were still uh, attached. They were, they were called the golden slippers. They were really uh, wonderful. And uh, as, I, as I was training for this astronaut maneuvering unit, and I really felt like we were going to have a really good, successful last mission, and somehow NASA felt that the series of missions where spacewalking had not been too successful, and they decided to cancel this number one Air Force experiment in the whole Gemini program. And that was my biggest mistake, not to tell them that I really knew what I was doing with the kind of training underwater but I let it go, and they removed that experiment, and instead there were just sort of Mickey Mouse things to do in the back of the adapter, hook a piece of Velcro together, screw this thing, and throw this switch. And so but, obviously it was a very successful rendezvous. But, but the, I mean, the, EVA. the EVA, yeah. So what, oh, what did we do? We went to a Navy place Pensacola, and everybody got checked out in scuba diving, so, even the Navy guys. So you had a successful Gemini 12, which was the end of the Gemini program. Right, Gene? Yeah. That was it. So then, right we're, and then we're on to Apollo, and of course, Randy, did you want to jump in with something there? that I cut you off. I, I apologize. No, we're fine. If they, okay. uh, time that we were flying Gemini 12, many of us were working that mission. We were also getting ready for Apollo. Right. So we had the uh, first of the Saturn launches there. So basically we had both control rooms up and operating there. And that was probably one of the toughest times from a standpoint of scheduling and training we ever had. So, um, so Apollo 1, you know the tragedy of the fire and Apollo 1 and losing Ed White, Virg Grissom, Roger Chafee. Uh, Frank Borman, you were the only astronaut on the investigating committee, the 21-month period. Um, what happened in those 21 months? What was the process? What was learned? And uh, how confident were you when you got to Apollo 7? Well, the, the, uh, I think the, the genius of Jim Webb, who was an, the NASA administrator, shown through there because he, he convinced Congress to allow NASA to investigate itself and they appointed a, a group of people of which I was one but uh, the the investigation was uh, no holds barred and it was, it was uh, a very hard-hitting indictment of both NASA and North American and I think that uh, out of that came the uh, the uh, block two we called it an improved Gemini I mean Apollo spacecraft that uh, eventually uh, was very, very successful. And I honestly believe, had it not been for, uh, for the fire, we might have had a, uh, a in-flight in tragedy that would have canceled the program. So I was, I think that NASA at that point, 
was probably the finest managed federal, federal bureaucracy that's ever been uh, ever been in place. And sometimes I look back on it. I look back on it, and from the country standpoint, I think we'd have been a lot better off if NASA had been running the Defense Department during Vietnam rather than. Uh, <laughs> uh. Fred, Fred Hayes, you know, we're not up to 13, obviously, yet, because we're going in sequence here. But what, in terms of personnel and training, what were you doing uh, while all these other things are going on to bring you up to speed for whatever you would be assigned down the road? Well, at the front end, uh, when I joined the program, the same as Al described. We, uh, we went through about six months of... Uh, textbook training, some field, rudimentary field trips, first geology field trips, and then we got assigned to uh, different disciplines. And uh, I got assigned to uh, Jim McDivitt, uh, who was going to fly the first limb, and Ed Mitchell and I. And uh, he gave us very uh, simple marching orders. Uh, he said, I want you to go to Grumman and make sure I got a good limb. That was it. So uh, Ed and I uh, together, I'm sure mutually, I, I know I spent seven months out of one nine months at Grumman in test. And I'd been in test in every vehicle up through six. In fact, I did not do any test on the one we flew on 13. Uh, but I'd been in, uh, in vehicle test, uh, sometimes uh, slipping limbs. I probably had uh, several weeks sleeping in limbs when the test would get halted and you just... Uh, stopped and waited for next things to get figured out and proceed. So that was kind of what I was doing in that period. In fact, I was up at Grumman at the time the Apollo 1 fire came, and Jim uh, called me and said, come home. So even though you weren't assigned to cruise at this point, and back to Gene for a moment, everybody was deeply involved in this whole uh, engineering process, working together to make the whole program work? I think we were very fortunate because not only we had uh, top-level leadership that made uh, made things happen, we had a uh, mission control team now that become probably the finest systems engineers that existed in the planet at that time. Because generally, our, our training process—you started training early—was to send the controllers out to the factory, get to know the people who are doing the design and testing, bring back the bundle assembly drawings that was used to build the spacecraft, translate them into doc documentation that you could use in real time. We did the same thing up at Draper Labs, get the program listings and then decompose that to stuff that was useful. So this is the sort of background we had when we went in to help Frank and the team that was looking at what do we got to do different for this next generation of Block II spacecraft. After the fire in Apollo 1, Gene, you had a meeting. What, what did you say? And uh, what was the result of your... Well, this, this was... Uh, I had a bunch of young pups. They'd never been through... Uh, a disaster of this type before and I got them all in a conference room and I started off talking about the fact that we ought to assume responsibility because we were behind the power curve and our work in mission control the control center wasn't ready the training process wasn't working nobody really had done their job and I think across the board from a standpoint of program we all had to assume responsibility for that particular failure and the loss of the crew and basically, I talked about and established two words, which are going to be the sounding board. Uh, we're going to use tough and competent. We're going to put it on our blackboards, and we won't erase it until we finish the Apollo program. Tough meaning we are forever accountable for what we do, and in the case of Apollo 1, what we failed to do. I was in the console on the shift before that accident, and there are things I think I could have done. Mm. Well, so you're on the crew for seven. First man flight. How confident were you in the entire process because you were going to fly it? Well, at the time we flew, it was, I was quite confident in it, but what people today don't realize is if you talk about the Apollo program today, most of the public thinks of Apollo 11, maybe Apollo 13 and that, but to put the whole thing in perspective, uh, we were originally, Wally Shaw, Don Isley and I were on Apollo 2 crew. Uh, the same spacecraft as Apollo 1. Uh, all the changes we were trying to make in it uh, caused a, a lot of delays. It got canceled. Then we became the backup crew for Apollo 1. 
after three months, we had the fire on the pad and lost our prime crew. Three weeks later, we got the, uh, the first Apollo mission. And I have to tell you that the spacecraft was certainly uh, not great, like uh, Gene said, but uh, in the next 21 months, uh, we lived at the contractors. I was on the road maybe 275 days one year, I remember. But we, uh, uh, I think it was 1,040 changes that were made in the spacecraft, some of which were for the systems and the mechanics. But a lot of it was for the operational changes that we had wanted to do before and had been uh, passed up because of the delay that it would cause in the schedule. So we got all those kind of things in. So when Apollo 7 actually flew, it was the most successful first test flight ever, even to this day. And I'll add one more thought here, what, also what the public doesn't think about. The, uh, that was the first of five giant steps to the moon, every one of which was very critical. We tested the command module. And Apollo 8, uh, was a, it broke the uh, concern people might have from getting away from the Earth's gravity. They went out around the moon. Uh, Apollo 9, then they were testing the lunar module. That was done in Earth orbit here. I think that was a pretty risky mission because uh, without, if they couldn't get back together, there was no heat shield on the lunar module. In Apollo 10, they had a complete rehearsal for the Apollo 11 landing right down to 50,000 feet. So when Apollo 11 went, actually everything had been done before except that last 50,000 feet, uh, but it was one hell of a fine job, nearly perfect. Frank and Jim. See, I'm saying Frank and Jim now. I don't know, is that right? Or, and I said, okay. <laughs> Frank, um, Apollo 8, the mission was changed from what to what and why? Jim and Bill Anders and I were originally on Apollo 9, which was a uh, really a repeat of Apollo 8, a, a Earth orbital rendezvous mission with a lunar module and a command module. The, the lunar module, thanks to Fred's uh, diligent uh, inspection, it, it, was, uh, it was way behind. And so, uh, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> I didn't mean it that way. I mean, you're making it, you're making it perfect. <laughs> and, 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 and the uh, CIA had pretty good information that the uh, Soviets were going to go to around the moon before the end of the year. So we were out at Downey. I got a call from, from Deke Slayton to come back. I got in the airplane, went back there, and I walked in the room, and he, he said, we want to change Apollo 8. I want to change your mission to Apollo 8 and go to the moon in a lunar orbit mission in December. Can you do it? And, I, and we said, yeah. I said, yes. And uh, I went back and told Jim and Bill, and I think we're all delighted with that, with that mission and that change. Mm -hmm. It turned out to be a... A, uh, a very exciting process, and uh, it all worked perfectly. So describe the mission, Jim. You, you launch and you head to the moon, you leave Earth's gravity. First time human beings had ever done that, right? Well, there are certain changes that were required. Number one was the fact that we weren't going to do Earth orbit, but we we're doing the navigation 240,000 miles all the way to the moon. So. One of the changes that they had to be made in the short time that was allotted was changing the whole navigation system. And uh, consequently, I felt I cut myself up at MIT a couple uh, days and learning the new technique that they had developed for using the stars for, uh, for navigation. And then, of course, our other job was uh, looking for suitable landing spots uh, to uh, make sure that the, uh, the spacecraft that would land, which we didn't know at that time, would uh, we'd have the greatest chance of survival. So those spots would be the smooth areas. We call it the Mari or the seas. Uh, but I think that when we look back at Apollo 8 it, with uh, Frank and Bill and myself, that uh, what really came from it was several things. One, and I think that Bill says it graciously, we, Bill has also 
all, always mention that, hey, we went to the moon to explore the moon and we discovered the Earth, uh, which I think it puts it in just a, one thing. Bill's photograph, I think, uh, said it all in one So picture. you admit that Bill Anders took that photograph? Well, that's been 25, 30 years, I guess. <laughs> They're very reluctant, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and then coming back, and, uh, and you have to remember the tenure of the time. I mean, 1968. Uh, the Vietnam was going on. There was dissidents in the universities. There was two assassinations of prominent people. There was disruption in the uh, Democratic uh, uh, Convention. Uh, and yet, on the last bit of, uh, of the flight, just in, taken off on the 21st of December, three guys to orbit the moon for the very first time and to uh, mentioned that uh, the first 10 verses of Genesis, which I thought was very appropriate at that time that we did that, uh, to come back. I think that put a cap, finally, on a very sort of bad year of 68. And wh what was that? Uh, you, you got an email, or not email those days, uh, <laughs> a, a telegram, I'm sorry. Said, uh, th thank you, Apollo 8. You saved 1968. When you got around to the back of the moon, how surprised were you at what the back of the moon looked like, if at all? Well, we, we had uh, photographs of the back of the moon prior to us going. So we did have some pretty good idea of the, the far side of the moon is not like the near side. The near side has these huge uh, uh, seas, sea of tranquility, you know, sea of serenity. The backside uh, is more uh, concentrated in smaller craters, lots of craters. There's two prominent features that the Russians first found because they were the first people to actually photograph the backside. But the only thing that really came out of their photographs was one of a crater called Tsiolkovsky, which is a beautiful crater uh, with a, a white center and a dark mari in the middle. Uh, and then the Sea of Moscow, which uh, they named, which was the one sort of large uh, uh, area uh, of a, imagine of a, uh, of, a, of a hit of something, much like the near side. But, but most of it is, is gray uh, sand or gray looking, no color whatsoever, uh, sort of forbidden in a little way, some awe-inspiring in some other way. and. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, it was something that you realized what was there, and it was uh, challenging. Uh, but like I said, uh, I think what we brought back, uh, more so than the later lunar flights, because uh, the ones that landed on the moon, that was their job. Our job was really to open up the fact that what we really had back here on Earth that, uh, for the very first time. What was that moment like when you, when you came around, when you saw you finally saw uh, Frank when you finally saw Earth. And I don't hear too well. What'd you say? What did he say? Oh, uh, well, uh, he said, uh, "What was it like when we first saw Earth?" Well, I think that was the high point of the mission for all of us looking back at the Earth. It's the only place in the whole universe that had any color, and it was, it was a long way from home. And I, I, that sort of focused our attention for longer than it should have. I had these had trouble keeping these guys busy. Uh, we're doing their job because they all were looking at the earth. But I, I want to mention one other thing. You know, we had, what, four months, right, Jim, to prepare for a, and usually it takes at least over a year to prepare for a flight. And in one afternoon, we were able to, to knock out a flight plan for Apollo 8, thanks to the genius and the leadership of Chris Kraft, one of the great, great, I would say, heroes of NASA, and the only one that's still living. They're all so I, I, I think any, any discussion of the uh, Apollo program is remiss if you don't mention the part that Chris Kraft had in it. What was that?
How much time did you have to get those pictures of Earth? How quickly did that have to happen that turned into the stamp? Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Yeah. Uh, the, the sequence of actually taking that photograph was something like this. Uh, I think it was taken on the third revolution because the first two we were concentrated on what we were doing, looking at the moon, checking out the, the, the uh, craters, making sure that the orbit that we had was consistent with what, we, what was going to happen in the future. And then on the third orbit, we suddenly saw on the right window, I think, in fact, I think it was made the funny thing, the, the, the uh, Earth came up. And I said, look at that. And then, uh, then either Bill or Frank said, oh, gosh, look at that. And then I said, we ought to take a photograph of that. And uh, but that time, the, the spacecraft started to move. It was moving around, and, and we lost sight of it until it came around to the left window. And uh, I saw it up again, and I said, uh, you've got to take a photograph of this. And so Bill got the camera, but it had black and white film in it, and I got the color film after he yelled at me once or twice. And uh, he put the color film in. And then, of course, he took the picture. But I'll let you know a little secret. I said, Bill, this is the way it goes. <laughs> you, you, you compose it in this manner. Uh, you see how the lunar surface goes down this way and the Earth comes up that way? Now, just now, OK, take it. And I showed him where the button was. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to tell Bill what he just said. You know, you could do that right now, Walt. You know, you got one of these if you want. Jim, uh, Jim, I Frank. remember there was a time when uh, Neil was a backup on Gemini 8, and you and I were on the crew because Mike Collins was on Gemini, or the E mission to begin with. Let's go back to the Bible. <laughs> um, whose idea, where did that come from for you, you it's, three, it's you and Bill? It's a good thing. I think Frank could probably really tell more about exactly how we read the, uh, uh, the first 10 verses. As one of the geniuses of NASA, one of the things that I thought was unusual again about this organization, we were told about six weeks before the flight that we were going to have a television uh, program around while we are going around the moon that would probably have the largest audience that had ever listened to a human voice. And, uh, and you know, we were all up to our ears and trying to figure out how to, what we were going to do. And so I asked uh, Julian Shearer, who was head of PR, I said, what do you want us to do? And the only answer we got was something appropriate. He said, do something appropriate. Uh, Can you imagine that happening today? Huh? <laughs> and so uh, we were busy, and uh, we all tried to come up with something, and that it all ended up seeming trite to us. So I had a good friend in Washington, uh, Cy Borg, and I called him up, and I said, Cy, you got to help us. Uh, he, he had worked for Newsweek, and he was a wonderful man. And, and he tried to come up, and he couldn't. So he finally passed it off to a friend. Joe Leighton, I believe it was, and, uh, and he, he was a long-time writer. He couldn't come up with either, but finally his wife, who had been raised in, the, in a convent in uh, France and was a French resistance writer, came down after he'd been making uh, attempts all night, and he, she said, well, why don't you start at the beginning? And he said, where? And she said, Genesis in the Bible, and that's how it happened. Incidentally, incidentally, we never, we never got that. We didn't clear it. We didn't. We, I don't think. I don't think you guys even knew what we were going to say. That, that was a, that was a genius of this country. It was wonderful. Wow. One more little tidbit on this. After we did that, uh, we got back. We were sued uh, for combining uh, government. And <laughs> so, uh, oh, uh, so, uh, but uh, we were uh, had a talk at the uh, at Congress with a joint venture, uh, and we mentioned that, and the Supreme Court justices were down there, and they said, "Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it." <laughs> yeah. We got Madeline, Madeline Murray O'Hare that sued, right? 
Uh, Jim, wasn't that uh, Frank? Madeline Murray O'Hare, right? Madeline Murray O'Hare, yeah, exactly. So, um, Walt just said, the, the next missions, nine, ten, you know, all set up, eleven. So, Buzz, how confident, what did you think the odds were that you and Mike and Neil were going to not only get to the moon, but walk on the moon and get back in one piece. What did you think the odds were? Well, Neil and I ended up, along with Fred, on the backup crew for Apollo 8. And so, 9 and 10, we would be on the prime crew. Uh, but Neil felt that uh, Mike Collins had missed the flight on Apollo 8 because Jim Lovell was going to fly with Neil and I, and it wasn't because Jim Lovell talked so much that, that he moved to uh, Frank's flight on Apollo 8, but it was because Mike Collins needed uh, a back operation for a pinched nerve. So uh, that's why Fred ended up uh, on the backup crew for Apollo 8. And now Neil felt that Mike, having not been involved in Apollo 8, should be uh, involved in Apollo 11. And I guess they finally felt that I was up to that kind of a mission. So when when the announcement did came come up, uh, I remember going back and, and saying to uh, Joan, you know, we're going to land a mission, we're going to make a try, and I would almost prefer to be on a later flight that does more interesting things, but Rather than being at the peak of all the public attention, which I did not look forward to at all, but I realized that the crewmates I had, there was no way that I could even come close. And so that person at that time, my wife, was the only one that knew I said anything about that at the time. So how surprised were you when Neil got out said what he said, walked no, in, and then took that picture of you. That's, the, that's you in that yeah. photograph from Apollo but, 11. But in the training, the, the three of us felt that maybe there was a 60% chance that we would be able to land successfully. But of course, there were many things that could happen. Right, Frank? The, or Jim? Yeah, there were many things that could happen that would cause things to be aborted. So we felt there, were, there was a 95% chance of coming home safely, but a 60% chance of being able to successfully land. What do the and numbers... six out of seven flights landed on the moon, yeah. and we were not uh, using a Ouija board or anything. We just Yes, that, that was that was about our odds. What do the numbers twelve zero one and twelve zero two mean to you? Uh, well, before the mission, not a whole lot. <laughs> we knew that there was a book about this thick with all the procedures and all the program alarms that could come up, and. We had uh, started the descent, and as we were starting the maneuver, uh, going face down, Neil looked down and he said, I think we're going to be a little bit long. And I said, how in the world could he possibly, at the beginning of power descent, come up and say, I think we're going to be a little long? Well, a little further along, uh, we had to yaw around and pitch forward so the landing radar could pick up the, the surface. And so now we're face 
uh, facing forward, but still uh, the engine is pointing. And, and a while after that, a program alarm comes on. And what it does is it, it wipes out the displays of what you're looking, looking at. And the alarm goes. And uh, so you shut off the alarm. Uh, and it restores it to what it is, but we don't know what the program alarm is, but there's this dictionary bound between us, and we were just not gonna pull out the dictionary to look and see what it was, but there happened to be an engineer who had been very well schooled, and uh, I think you ought to take over from here, Jim. Yeah, I think that's a uh, that's a real interesting point there because the uh, go back into you mentioned training and we started, and by this time in the space program the training was truly exceptional, and we had a team of controllers whose principal job was to test the team from a standpoint of knowledge, the integration, the integration with the crew right on down the line. We got a Capcom, I had Charlie Duke and this, and uh, generally the final training run was always looked at by the team as sort of graduation exercise. Why are the uh, simulation supervisor that they said this team isn't ready to graduate yet? So he uh, threw us a, uh, a decent series of problems in there, one of which we started uh, exercising or experiencing various program alarms. And uh, we aborted, we saw the program alarms, we aborted the training run. And then Sim Soup came in and says, Flight, why did you abort that training run? Your mission rule says you need two cues. What was your second cue? There was none. So we got together with the uh, Draper Labs, and overnight we learned an awful lot about the program alarms. And uh, it's interesting, the actual descent, uh, Buzz mentioned that we were going to be downrange. What happened? The crew had not fully depressurized the tunnel. We have a dumb computer on board the spacecraft, so over the period of time at two orbits, basically we're now further downrange than we should have been. And immediately, as soon as we acquire, my trajectory guy says we're halfway to our abort limit on radio component of velocity, and abort is not a word that you use casually in mission control. But basically, we worked that problem. We were starting monitoring that. But as we were waiting for the landing radar to come in to update the true altitude that the spacecraft was above the surface, we experienced that same set of program alarms that we had in our final training run. And you want to talk about uh, gobbling up that problem, boy, we were ready. We sucked that thing up. Charlie Duke passed it up. He'd say, we're going that alarm, going that alarm. So basically, a lot of times, I think back to the uh, quality of the training we had, but in particular, the quality of the instructors that we had that were teaching us. By the way, what is the average age of the controllers? At that time, we were between 26 and 27. The majority of controllers were roughly about four years out of college, four to five years. Let me add, that, at that time also, the average age in the astronaut office was probably about 38, uh, something like that. And uh, the oldest active astronaut we had was Wally Schirra, who retired at the age of 43. And I think today the average age in the astronaut office is above 45. Right. Gene, uh, you had an experience on a simulation flight that we had a program alarm before Apollo 11 launched. We, we had some uh, alarms of that type back in the uh, Apollo 9, but basically uh, we found that was really an aberration that was in the simulation software at that time. That was not really an issue. But we, again, that brought us up to speed to look at computer program alarms. So we, had a, we had a great bunch of people, people working down in the trench, our trajectory guys. And Steve Bales was the guy, believe it or not, uh, after the course of the mission, the team voted. We went out to the West White House, and we had this big do party out there with uh, President Nixon, and uh, our, my guidance officer accepted the award for the team that day. So 11 is a big success, and the whole world knew it. Fred Hayes, well, 12 was good, and that went fine, Gene. Fred, 12, there's a crew change. So Mattingly can't go, Swigert's in to join you and Jim. How much did that affect what you were doing and how soon did that happen, the switch, before you had to launch? 
Well, that, that week, uh, uh, was a, uh, when the exposure happened with Charlie Duke at a birthday party, he had had his son at, and we were all exposed because normally prime and backups were together in some way at a meeting or whatever every day. And uh, they started uh, taking blood every day and shipping it off to some doctor in Cincinnati who was the world's expert on measles. And uh, it, it turned out at the time that, uh, unfortunately, uh, well, Ken and Jack Schweiger were both bachelors, but Jack had had measles, and Ken had never had measles, even as a child. And that uh, was highly, obviously, suspect. Maybe he would come down with measles. And I know Jim argued, that, well, you know, what better place can you come down with measles than floating around in zero G in that comfortable environment? Uh, but that was not bought. And uh, unfortunately, and so Jack uh, replaced uh, uh, Ken two and a half days before launch. It was, it was very emotional at the time because I'd served on uh, two backups. I'd been the backup uh, on eight, and then I was backed up Buzz on 11. And the way mentally I always got into it was uh, to not suffer the disappointment of not flying about uh, within a month before the flight, I'd sort of mentally back away and say, well, I've done all this work, but I'm just going to go get, get to watch somebody else fly. So you kind of mentally backed away. And I'm sure Jack Swigert was in that uh, mental state. And of course, on the other hand, when you're fixing to go fly, uh, you look out at that big booster lit up at night and you sort of get a little butterflies and say, man, this is finally going to happen. So it was a radical uh, emotional shift for both of those individuals. Uh, unlike what was a kind of a connotation in the movie, there was absolutely no question in our minds that Jack could perform the mission uh, technically and, and do what he needed to do. So there was never any concern that way. It was more of this uh, personal thing and unfair because Ken had, had a lot of friends uh, he invited and family to come to the launch. Uh, they had irreversible uh, motels, signed up for several days, uh, had airline tickets, and they obviously now were coming to see a different person fly. We had PPKs, a personal preference kit, and I spent some time uh, with family and friends to what up small things. You were very restricted on size and weight on what I might fly for them. And uh, obviously, Jack didn't have the time to do that, and Ken had one already packed on board. So it was more that connotation of the, that uh, shift out from a technical standpoint. Uh, we went through simulation. I think we were in simulators to about 8, 8 o'clock the night before launch, uh, mainly going through the dynamic phases, just launch, entry, and rendezvous, even though we used, uh, obviously, the same books, same checklist, same procedures, we wanted to make sure that when certain things were called, that the backup crew hadn't developed a vernacular in talking to each other that we might not be aware of. So we, we went through it from that standpoint, not the fact that Jack couldn't, couldn't perform what he needed to do. So Jim, you're 200,000 miles out, what happened? Well, well, first of all, let me mention two things. Uh, uh, Jack was, uh, had helped develop the malfunction procedures for the command module. So if we had to have a replacement for Ken, uh, Swikert was the guy to have. So we were very happy with him, even though you know, he suddenly got on board when he didn't expect it. The second thing, which is a little bit more humorous, during this change around and all the stuff that he had to do to get ready, uh, about a thousand miles out after we were going, Jack says, I forgot to file my income tax. <laughs> now you have to remember this was April 13th, or about that time, and uh, he didn't file his tax. And so that was submit, uh, sent down to Mission Control, and a little while later we got the reply, don't worry, the president will take care of it. <laughs> uh, things were good for the first two days. Uh, the major change that we had, which made it again dicey, th this was actually 
a mission that was plagued from the very beginning. It had a damaged liquid oxygen tank installed, unknown to us, which got further damaged during the last test. Uh, we had a uh, an engine come on, uh, uh, go out on the liftoff of the Saturn V. The center engine of the other thing went, went off. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, two days out, uh, uh, on April 13th, that explosion occurred. Uh, so uh, it was one of the third landing to one of, of survival at that particular time. Uh, but uh, it's a, a monument to uh, the mission control people who are able to take a, a certain catastrophe and, and with the help, uh, uh, with their help, and we can finally take, uh, take over and, and overcome all the crisis that we had. So Gene, what, what's going on in, in, in control at that point when you know something bad's happened so what kind of mode are you in at that well, point? Well, the, uh, the key thing was, was uh, when we started off, the lunar module was not supposed to be active. So I did not even have a team in place during this phase of the mission. You don't power the thing up until you get up in the uh, lunar vicinity, the lunar orbit up there, and get ready to actually go through the uh, start of the descent procedure. So the key thing was is that uh, I had just a single controller in there, and they were reviewing their procedures. Uh, it was about 55 hours, 55 minutes into the flight. We had just finished the television broadcast with the crew that we had up there. They had secured the television and basically the uh, backup team. Next team was uh, uh, coming in for shift handover. So we went through the normal uh, pre-sleep checklist and got down to the final item, which uh, requested a cryo stir. Now, the fuels we use on board the spacecraft, cryogenic, oxygen, and hydrogen, and basically they tend to stratify and develop into two-phase condition, part liquid, part gas in the tank. So they had some, uh, basically, uh, uh, pumps, not pumps, but uh, uh, devices in there to spin it up and uh, basically uh, make a homogeneous mixture in the tank. Uh, so that was basically what they were doing. They were doing the cryo stir, and basically, uh, very shortly thereafter, I got a call uh, from the crew that basically indicated Houston, we got a problem. Uh, I went through three phases of downloading in there because we had already seen a couple electrical problems uh, on the same shift in there. And we had uh, basically an unexplained antenna shift uh, in the uh, communication system. We also had an instrumentation problem. So as soon as Jim called, I thought, gee, we've seen a lot of electrical glitches when we'll uh, get the crew to sleep, and then we'll start working this problem. Uh, shortly thereafter, one of the controllers said the crew reported a pretty large bang, and now I was downloaded to uh, tread lightly lest you step in some stuff you don't want to step into. But about the time, about 12 minutes after this event, Jim indicated they were venting the oxygen, and basically then it was survival mode. So it was basically, we'll solve the problem, tread lightly, survival. And that was basically the uh, sheet months we went through. So Gene, I mean, excuse me, Jim, who said what? What was the, the actual verbatim line that was said well, to what, control? Those, that famous line, here's the actual situation, because people ask me that, you know, on right. and on. The first time, Jack said, Houston, we've had a problem here. Now, that transmission went down to Mission Control, Jack Lausma was the Capcom, and I think there was a change or uh, he didn't hear it, so he said, say again, please. And then I said, Houston, we have a problem here. I repeated what Jack said. I said, we have a main B bus undervolt, and that's the electrical problem which I first relayed to Mission Control. Uh, so that's how that whole sequence came, and. My only regret is that, that I didn't uh, incorporate it or do something. <laughs> so when you looked out at the, the explosion, what did you see? Well, what it, had it, it dawned on me. That when, when the accident first occurred and we lost two fuel cells right away, I saw that and they went out the line. But mission controls or mission rules stated that if you lose one fuel cell, the landing on the moon is off. One fuel cell alone will give you enough electrical power 
to get around the moon and back home safely. And so there was a wave of disappointment right now because I thought to myself, you know, I've been here already. I, my idea is to land on the moon, not just to go around the moon. And then I looked up at the instrument panel and I, my eyes focused on the instruments that told me the condition of two huge liquid oxygen tanks. And when I looked at the quantity gauge of one of those tanks, the needle read zero. And when I looked at the quantity gauge of the second and last tank, I could see the needle go down ever so slightly, but something that you would never see in the normal usage of oxygen on a flight to the moon. And that's when that old lead weight went down on my stomach and that searing sensation you get when you're in deep trouble and don't quite know how to go out of, get out of it. <laughs> hmm. So what happened then, Gene? Yeah, yeah one of the uh, things uh, Frank mentioned earlier was the quality of the leadership we had. Throughout this entire problem, particularly in the first 24 hours, uh, they didn't seek out briefings, etc. They were following along and their question was, how can we help you? And that was the, uh, the kind of people that we had in there. They were letting the young pups work the problem, but basically they were uh, superb, our bosses. So how quickly did you make decisions and what were they about what you were going to do? Well, the first thing was in the first hour, it was to get the crew back on a free return trajectory and basically get them coming home. We also recognized that we're gonna have to use the lunar module as a lifeboat now, fortunately, as a result of training, we had developed a lot of these procedures during the uh, Apollo 9 mission. So we had a benchmark to start, but the key thing was, was getting the people in place to start working the problem. So who, who on the ground did you have working the problem? I mean, is there a crew in the module at that point who's... No, no, we hadn't even, we didn't have time to get into simulation. Everybody was, we were really, we were trying to get to a stable position with the crew and the spacecraft so we could get time to think. Mm -hmm. And the key thing was, is that we knew that the command service module uh, was going to die because we had pulled two of the fuel cells offline. The third fuel cell was about 20 minutes from going south on us. So we got the crew over to the lunar module, and then it was to get that guy powered up sufficiently so we could transfer the navigation data from the command module, which computer, which is going to die, and get it over in the lunar module. So basically we had uh, that entire process going through, and it was really interesting to watch that team work. It took about 20 minutes before everybody started working in the same direction. Mm. But uh, once we got moving, we moved. So Fred, what was going on with you three guys? Well, when, when this happened, I was still in the lunar module putting away things we had pulled out because we just completed a TV show. You'd appreciate that. And the show had to go on, right? So I was putting away the equipment we had pulled out. Uh, when I got up to the right seat and looked at the panel, I, I frankly didn't pick up the fuel cells, but I, not I did notice that tank two, auction tank two, the quantity uh, pressure was down and that meant an abort. There's no question that when you lose a single critical element in a, in a system, I didn't have to reference mission rules that we, I knew the landing was off. So I was just at that time sick of my stomach with disappointment that you know, I trained through two missions and here was the big chance and it was gone in an instant. The next thing that hit was confusion because we had seven caution and warning lights on a master alarm and a computer blue restart light. And it did not make sense because these, these spacecraft are very simple. Uh, each system uh, stood alone on its own. They were simplex in that sense. It was no big computer that was integrating everything. So there was no way one failure could have caused all those lights in different systems. In the RCS, uh, we had AC overload, we had DC undervolt, uh, and the cryogenic uh, lights on, and it just didn't make sense. Uh, you know, kind of in simulation, we had a rule, uh, sort of a standing rule, that when they gave us failures, they normally would not give us one, one failure, more than one failure, one time in one system. It's kind of like, uh, I guess, God was not gonna be so unkind as to give us more than one failure one time. So th this was, but it turned out that many of the lights were false lights, the G-shock of the explosion had closed some of the valves, had overcome the spring tension, 
and some of the uh, gas and the RCS valves and valves that normally were open had been closed. Now on our panel, we had a little talk back that was gray and barber pole to a switch you'd move to sit, tell you it was open or closed. But we did not have, that was not connected to the valve. That was connected to the switch. So it wasn't until Mission Control, who had telemetry to the valves, noticed that and had us recycle some valves, uh, most of those caution warning lights went away, except the ones obviously involved with the electrical system. There was uh, one little incident that's kind of interesting because it, it shows some of the, the thought process that's going through. Uh, of course, we lost three uh, fuel cells, two oxygen tanks, computer went off the line, and, and, and in mission control, when they first saw the, the instrumentation on their consoles that were reflected through coming down from telemetry from our instrument panel, the first thing was, hey, no, this has got to be a communications problem. You know, we can't lose three fuel cells, two oxygen tanks, and do all this at one time. I mean, we, don't we believe in redundancy? Don't, don't we have uh, reliability at those 16 nines or something like that? And so it was a little time, wasn't it? Until uh, finally it dawned on everybody. And, and, and meanwhile, Fred and I were sneaking our way into the Lunar Module to find out just what we had to work with. And what did you have to work with? What did you have to do in terms of maintain electrical power? Well, the first thing, and I, and, uh, uh, I think that uh, Gene was, was correct, we had to transfer the guidance system from the Dyne command module uh, to the lunar module. Now, the two are not made, made it exactly in, great in the same X, Y, Z planes. So there was a correction that we had to do from the angles that the command, that Schweikert sent to me to what I had to put the correction in before I could put it into the lunar module computer system to make sure that the guidance system of the lunar module corresponded to the same position of the, of the spacecraft that we had in the, in, uh, that we did have. And uh, so uh, I got the angles and then I asked them to say, would you check my arithmetic? <laughs> you were doing this manually with a uh, Yeah, in those pen. days we did things manually. I had a pen pencil and, uh, and, and I had my little checklist and then it said, I put the angle in and there was the correction that I had to do and then I wrote it down. And so I called them up and I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't afraid to ask anybody <laughs> if two and two are really four in this particular instance. Yeah, you have to really appreciate how dumb the computers we had in those days. Because really, the ones we had in mission control, 90% of the computing resources was associated with tra trajectory. And only a very small percentage was associated with driving displays. So basically, this was a pencil paper computation we had to get, and it had to be perfect. So what happened next, Jim? Well, we uh, got through, and of course, the, the uh, 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 mission control called up and said, hey, you're in the lunar module. We said, yes, and we're turning on the systems, and we transferred the guidance. And they said, then, uh, this is the best idea to get us back on the free return course. That free return course would get us back around the moon, back down to the Earth, uh, and hopefully it would be a safe passage through the atmosphere. And uh, that was something which we really wanted because at the time that we were, or the, the course that we were on when the explosion occurred was not a free return course. If we, if we didn't have the main propulsion system at this time, we lost that along with the electrical power and the oxygen. Consequently, as we would, if we went around the moon and came back to the Earth, the closest point of approach to the Earth would have been about 40,000 miles out. And consequently, we were in this hybrid long elliptical orbit, and we could be there for decades, just going out 240,000 miles to the apogee, coming back around Earth, but not, not close enough. So we had to get back on that for return course. So that's where, of course, mission control had us and how they wanted us to, uh, to make the maneuver. Yeah, basically the uh, key thing was the decision process was get them a trajectory, start working the power management, power problem that we had, 
figure out how, what are we going to use because we left the inertial system up and we knew that being mechanical system there would be so drift. So we had to have some way to check that. Get ready in the vicinity of the moon, come up with the get home fast maneuver, then start working up the checklist that you needed for the reentry phase. While we were doing that, basically we found out that we had some aberration of the trajectory. So now with no computer, no display system, we had to come up with a way to basically ex execute a maneuver using the descent engine on board the spacecraft. The crew executed that thing there. We continued to work the problem, got the crew back into the Earth environment, believe it or not. Uh, we had to pr perform another maneuver, emergency maneuver, in the uh, final seven hours in there, which blew our electrical power profile. So now we're back trying to find some way to make up more power. And basically, we lost battery C during entry. So we lost one of our three batteries during entry. So, Fred, you yeah, Jim, sir. Yeah, go. Cool. Jim. There, there was one thing that was unusual uh, after we decided that the mission control was going to give us the proper attitude to maneuver to, to get back onto the free return course, and we'd use our landing engine for uh, that, that, that maneuver. Uh, the, the, the information was set up. We put it in the computer to, uh, and I started to manually make the maneuver to get to the new position, and I learned something that I took with me out of the space program into business. Always expect the unexpected, because we were flying in the lunar module, but we had attached to the lunar module the 60,000 pound dead mass, the command service module. The command module is the only thing that had a heat shield to get back into the Earth's atmosphere. The center of gravity was not in the center of the lunar module essentially to make the maneuvers. It was way out in the field someplace. And therefore, in the short period of time that I had, I had to figure out how to maneuver all over again. I had to figure out that when I put an input in, just what the output was going to be. And it took some time to do that, but fortunately, I finally got to the proper attitude so we could shoot, you know, use the lunar module engine to get back on what we thought was the free return course. So what were the breathing challenges, Fred? Breathing, oxygen. We lost everything in the lunar module. Fred had talked yeah. of that. No, the, the, I think you're referring to the CO2 buildup. Yeah. Build yeah. yeah. The, uh, the situation there was the LEM uh, had not enough cartridges. In fact, the spare cartridges were down on a mesa, on a descent stage, which were to be retrieved during the uh, first EVA. And even that would not have been adequate. So they had to figure out a way, people on the ground figured out a way to uh, use gray tape, stiff backs of checklists and whatever, to build a plenum around a square cartridge versus the cylindrical limb one and attach it to the intake hose on the, the lunar module's side and suck the, force the air to be sucked through that, uh, which served the purpose. And of course, there were an abundance of those cartridges available from the command module. I think we replaced it once. All we did was stuck another cartridge on and gray taped around it. And we could have just kept stacking those cartridges if we had to uh, to solve, solve that, uh, that problem. So how long did it take to get back to Earth? What was 145 hours? I'm sorry? What was the mission time? Right. How long did it take from the explosion before you got back to Earth's atmosphere? And well, you'd have to subtract 53 from 146. So I don't have my calculator with me, but uh, <laughs> yeah, this happened at 53 hours, uh, et cetera, and uh, the mission time was a little over 146 hours. So when you stepped onto the aircraft carrier, gentlemen, what was the mood? After we stepped? Yeah. After we got home? Yeah. Well, there's one of them. High elation, of course. We, uh, <laughs> the helicopter put us on the deck, and we waved at everybody, and uh, and uh, we thought that uh, we cheated death again. <laughs> oh, you no, know, one one thing I'll add uh, that, uh, of course, at the time we weren't too happy with uh, North uh, North American uh, with the uh, performance of the command module, <laughs> but you have to realize that we shut the thing off uh, for four days. And it got very cold. In fact, the water tanks were still found frozen after it was recovered back on the carrier. And uh, 
Fortunately, the Apollo 1 fire had done a fix with a lot of, not just a hatch, but a lot of wiring and better hermetically sealing of connectors, which again helped us because uh, the vehicles got very damp and wet. We had water, if you look behind the wall and the limb, had globs of water on every turn of a wiring or a, a connector path uh, for the plumbing. And when uh, we got ready to power up the command module, uh, Jack and I did that, and it was covered with water. We had to get a towel out to wipe off the instrument panel. And uh, we worried about that time about shorts. And that was those fixes done on Apollo 1 that saved us. Uh, in fact, Jack, we said we, we first steps was to put all the circuit breakers back in. And we say we'll count down and we'll push in six circuit breakers only on each side. And we'll s wait and see if we can smell insulation burning. <laughs> and then we can pull them back out quickly and discern which one was the bad one. And that's the way we went through all the circuit breakers, getting them in. And uh, we never had anything happen. And, the, and you think about it, frozen for four days, we violated specifications, certainly on the electronics equipment in that vehicle. And it worked, it came to life, and it worked perfectly. I mean, it, to me it was a, I kidded the subsystem manager some of them that they over-designed the vehicle, but it was, uh, it was a good machine. I mean, it went through that uh, abuse, if you will, and came back to life and got us through entry. And that's the story of Apollo 13. <laughs> There is that one last incident concerning 13. As we're coming down, and it appears that the things were working and the chutes came out and we finally slowed down and it appears that everything was okay. Swigert says, uh, listen, let's not tell them that we're okay. This might make a good movie. <laughs> And by the way, how many of you were aware that Jim was actually in the movie? Whole new career there, Jim. You're looking for it. So that's the volume 13. Gene, you look like you're... Yeah, one last comment on the splashdown. Once the crew got aboard the carrier, we had a sweetheart deal with the Cigar Institute of America. We went through uh, 14 uh, boxes of cigars there. <laughs> so 13 made it. Joe Engel, yeah, was on the backup crew for 14. Um, and later on, he got bumped off 17. You really seemed to get a bump that wasn't fair because... Anyway, especially off of 17. But tell us about 14. How successful was 14 and what was its mission, Joe? Uh, 14 was, was uh, Al Shepard's mission, of course, and uh, Ed Mitchell and Stu Rusin. And uh, uh, I happened to be with Gene Cernan and, and uh, Ron Evans and the backup crew for Apollo 14. So we were, we were uh, continually nipping at their heels to try and see if we couldn't get them to sprain an ankle or turn a knee or something. <laughs> we did. We, we uh, in fact, Al set up a kind of a crew retreat at, at a friend's cabin in Colorado. And um, Al did things right always. We got there and there were, there were uh, six Kawasaki mountain bikes there for us to ride. And, and, and um, Ron and I looked at each other, Gene and I actually looked at each other and said, here's our chance. Because <laughs> the guys are all competitive. And uh, we, we decided we would have this contest. We, they were in a parking lot with a, a dirt berm that kind of went up and, and uh, it, it graded off the lot level. So we, we, we tried these Kawasaki's out, running up there, jumping and seeing how far we could jump with the, with the uh, motorcycles and thought this is it this is a good deal we'll get Al go we'll go to Al into a competition and uh, we'll just keep going until we can get him to fall or something and uh, 
And uh, Ed Mitchell, bless his old intelligent heart, the guy had done a PhD from MIT or something like that. And 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 uh, Ed said, well, well, let's see how we would do this, uh, Joe. And so he had he had Gene and I out with the Kawasaki's running, demonstrating how you'd you know hit this berm and jump and leap and. And uh, so he had completely turned the tables on us. We were the ones doing, doing the risk, and uh, they, he was sitting back there laughing. Uh, and of course, it, it, it didn't, didn't work. But, uh, uh, but then, uh, so we rotated around, as Buzz explained earlier, we would rotate, uh, skip two missions, and then rotate back into the prime crew. So we were the prime crew for Apollo 17, and, and uh, uh, it, it turned out that the program lost or was the, the last three flights, Apollo 18, 19, and 20, were canceled, uh, which meant that uh, 17 was the last mission. And uh, Jack Schmidt was the lunar module pilot uh, back up on 15 and was going to be the prime on 18, but with 18 canceled. The, uh, the uh, scientific community, the, the ge geology community, uh, community were pushed very hard to have Jack move forward and put on the last flight to the moon as a lunar module pilot. And, you know, it wasn't my idea, but it sure made sense um, that you have a guy with a doctorate degree in field geology going to the moon if you've got a chance to get him there. So it was, uh, as I said, it was a disappointment, a very big disappointment, but uh, I understood the rationale behind it completely and um, was very proud of it. Incidentally, I, I don't know whether we, you know, the thing, I, I didn't get to go land on the moon, which I very much would like to have done, but that experience let me get close and get all the training for a lunar mission, which was totally incredible, and I think everybody in the, on the panel would agree. The, the education was there if you just wanted to soak a little bit of it, you could, but if it, there was so much to learn in, 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 in so many fields, so many disciplines, that I wouldn't have traded it for anything in the world. Plus. I got to know a lot better and got to work with and train with, uh, I'm not even, I don't want to get gooey now, but th this incredible bunch of true American heroes that you got on the stage here tonight, and I will never, I'll never be sorry for that. And, and, and Al, I mean, I, 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 you, Al, especially you, Al, I was looking over this way, but I wanted to include you on that, too. Okay. That's all right. Okay. That's all right, Joe. I'm right behind you all the way. <laughs> so, Al, 15, what were the new things that happened in 15? We talked early on from, you know, the Mercury to Gemini and so forth. What did what had happened before allow you to do on 15? Okay, what, um, 15 was a new... Um, model of spacecraft, we were upgraded, we carried a lot of extra equipment that had never been carried before, as you know. Uh, we carried the first lunar rover, the little electric car that they drove on the surface. Uh, it gave them uh, quite an extended uh, capability on the lunar surface. We carried a scientific instrument package into lunar orbit. Uh, in that, we had, a kind of interesting, we had two large cameras. The large camera, which is a high-resolution camera, was one that had been developed back in the 1950s by a company in Boston called Icon. And it was a ball optic and camera, but it was a camera that was designed to be flown in U-2 aircraft at 60, 70,000 feet. And uh, the Air Force had declared it obsolete before our flight, so we were able to get it on our flight. And I've often wondered what, uh, would, you know, when the Air Force declared that obsolete, I, I've always been curious about what they replaced it with because it had to be something pretty spectacular. Because I could take a picture from 60 miles of objects on the lunar surface down to about four feet. I actually have pictures of the lunar module or the lunar rover uh, sitting next to the lunar module at the landing site for Apollo 15. Um, I took about uh, uh, pictures of with that with that high resolution camera of about 25 percent of the moon surface, and along with that we had a mapping camera that did the same thing except. It took individual frames along the trajectory, um, and it had a laser altimeter uh, associated with it that recorded the, uh, the the altitude, if you will, of the of the film above the ground. And then I had a series of, I think six or seven, I forget now the exact number, but 
of remote sensors that were all on um, uh, on arms that I could extend, like the Canada arm kind of thing. And uh, we had um, like a microwave, we had x-ray, we had alpha particle, we had uh, mass spectrometer, we had all these things. In fact, I'll tell you about the mass spectrometer. Mass spectrometer is an interesting answer Oops. your phone, Dave. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Is that the next question coming up? <laughs> we had uh, the mass spectrometer um, we took because we were, we were just playing around with seeing if there was anything in, in the lunar atmosphere. We, 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 we really spent a lot of time on the science on our flight. And uh, so I'd stick the lunar, uh, I'd stick the mass spectrometer out for a while and, you know, say, you know, what's going on? And they actually picked up some stuff in lunar orbit, I think. If we go back and check the records, Gene, I think we'll find it uh, where they found something in lunar orbit, which is not supposed to be there, but it turned out to be urine. And uh, it, was, it was a result of a, of a urine dump that we had done a couple of revs before that, and it was still, stuff was still floating around out there in lunar orbit. So uh, we, 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 ac we actually recorded a little of us uh, from, from, from lunar orbit. Uh, but that, those are the things we carried. Now, the, 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 the lunar rover was a very, very interesting device. It was a little electric car that folded up almost into a suitcase size. I think it weighed about 480 pounds, something like that. It was, it was built by Boeing, but Boeing at the time, in fact, one of the big reasons that we started switching flights around was even if the lunar, the lunar module was late and that caused the 8-9 shift, uh, but uh, the, we, we thought the lunar rover was going to be late too. So we uh, got a hold of the General Motors people and asked them if they could help. And we ended up taking it down to Santa Barbara to the GM test range down there. And I'm trying to think, the fellow that ran that test range ended up as an administrator of NASA, I believe. Anyway, uh, they, in, within about a month they fixed it and we were all set to go. So it, it worked out really well. Was this a, did you go out to retrieve film? Did you do an EVA? Uh, yeah, I, I did a spacewalk on the way, you know, on the way back home. Uh, kind of an interesting uh, process there. It, it, it leads me to talk about a kind of a, a thing with me. Um, God bless engineers. Uh, they make everything that we use. Uh, I don't know how many are out here, uh, but uh, we we would have done we we would not have done any of the flights uh, if it hadn't been for the engineers. But somebody has to sit on the engineers uh, to keep them real. Okay, because uh, I think engineers can go out a little ways if they are given the opportunity. Well, I had a system by which I was going to recover all this film, and the system had already been prescribed before I got on a flight, and the system basically was an endless clothesline. I was to take out a, 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 a pulley with a clothesline on it, take it out and put it in a, a, in a, in a mount on the outside of the space, of the back of the uh, uh, service module, and one in the hatch, and Jim Rowan put one in the hatch. And then I'd walk out, or float out there, and I would take the canister, which is about 90 pounds, it's a pretty good sized canister, and clip it onto this clothesline, and then Jim would pull this thing back into the hatch and stow it inside the command module so we could get it back through the atmosphere. Well, I took a look at that, and I said, I, I, I don't like that. I, there's something wrong with it. It's not gonna work. I don't think it's gonna work right. Well, we have, we have, we have tested it completely in the water tank. We know it's going to work. Oh, well, let me ask you, what, what was the weight of the cassette that you put in it? Well, we made it out of Teflon, and we cut a lot of holes in it to make it neutrally buoyant. And I said, and, you, and you're using that as what's going to happen in space when you got 90 pounds instead of this lightweight thing. Well, we think it'll work. I said, I don't think it will. Uh, so I insisted on going in the zero-G airplane. And uh, as a matter of fact, that particular flight, I think, was that one. Uh, we set the world's record for the most number of zero-G flights. Uh, Harry Andonian from uh, Dayton came down and flew the airplane. And uh, we did 125 parabolas that day. Uh, and there's a picture around somewhere that, uh, that, that I think will attest to the fact. But anyway, the reason we took so long was I wanted to make sure this thing was either going to work or not. So we got, we, we got into it, and, and uh, it was very interesting to me because it's about a 30-foot stretch from the catch back to where the film cassettes were. And so that clothesline was 30 feet. And I said, I don't believe 
since there's no friction in space, you've got this 90 pound mass. We don't know what that mass is going to do. If there's any jerking on the rope at all, we got a problem. And sure enough, the thing got halfway back and a little jerk on the rope and the thing started swinging back and forth and it actually knocked the RCS quad right off the side of the service module. So we said, oh, well, I think we proved the point. We can't, we can't do that. So I said, okay, we gotta do something simple. Let's, let's do it from an engineering standpoint, but it's gotta be simple. Give me a wrist tether with a hook and I'll carry the damn thing back. All I gotta do is hold on to it, float back, give it to Jim, go back out and get the other one. I had two cassettes. Uh, so I said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll give that a whirl. So I had this wrist tether and it had a little hook on it and the engineers came back and they said, we, the safety people come back and they said, well, we, we like the idea of doing that, but we don't think it's very safe because if you hit that hook, it could come undone and you'd lose the cassette. And I said, okay, what do you want to do? They said, we want to put a hole in the hinge and put a pin in it. Okay, that's fine. I, I, I'll go along with that. I mean, that's an extra, extra precaution. So about two weeks went by and I came back again and they said, we are still not happy with it. I said, what's the problem? Well, we think that the pin is great, but we want to drill a hole in the end of the pin and put a cotter key in that so the pin won't come out and think, Jesus, where are we going to end this thing anyway? I mean, how far, how far do we have to go? But the point was that I, 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 I had this idea that, that the right engineering solution is the one that makes the most sense and is logical and is simple. And that's how you get things to work. How did you make it? Yeah, it worked. Anyway, uh, the ABA was fine. Uh, I, I went out a couple of times. Uh, one of the problems I ran into is that I had trained too well for it, so in 37 minutes I was done. And I'm thinking, holy mackerel, now what do I do? Um, I'd love to, well, I did go back out a third time, put my feet in some foot restraints and look, look out and I, it was unbelievable. I could see both the earth and the moon at the same time. They were, they were in my field of view. Wow. You got to think about that a little bit, but that's a pretty wow. unique place to be. Wow. Um, yeah. To all of you, um, what did it do to you, all of you, to look back at earth? Well, and see it. Well, frankly, uh, in these days, when I look back at the whole program, our time has changed, society has changed, NASA has changed. I just feel fortunate to have lived when I did and have had the opportunity to do what I did with Apollo. Yep. Uh, yeah. Dave, I think, I, th I, think, I think it's one of uh, I, I watched Earth right 75 times, and that's the most magnificent thing you can see. It's the only thing in our sky that has color like we see here on Earth. But I will tell you, the thing that impressed me more than looking at the Earth was looking at the universe out there. Uh, that to me was the most important part of the flight for me. There was a part of the trajectory around behind the moon, or a quarter section, where I was shattered from both the Earth and the, and, and the Sun, from the albedo of the Earth and from the sunlight. So I was in total darkness, and, 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 and the thing, and I'm sure we've all seen that, but if you, if, if you look at the sky out there, if you're in that, section of the trajectory and you look at the sky out there, you can't make out a single star because it's just a wash of light out there because there's so many stars out there. And it makes you think, you know, we are a very, very small part in a very, very big universe here. Uh, we're a uh, part of the Milky Way galaxy, of course, but we're about two thirds of the way out on an arm. Uh, we are a little planet with a planetary system. Uh, but if you were to count the number of suns or stars or whatever you want to call them, stars, let's say, in the Milky Way galaxy, you're, uh, you're, 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 you're talking about 400 billion stars. And if you start looking at the number of, uh, of galaxies out there, you're looking at what we know of today, what they can see and what they can measure out there, even with a Hubble, uh, we're talking a couple hundred billion. So you're looking at the number of stars. Out, it goes back, to, we, I, I think we all remember talking to Carl Sagan about that. Carl had this idea that that, that there are so many suns out there that have planetary systems and of those there are so many planets that could sustain life and no matter what number you assign to that, you come up with a positive number uh, for a planet out there somewhere that's going to have intelligent life. You can't get away from that fact. Yeah. I, I, do, I do still have one thought that I would like to leave with them because as we look at that, uh, and the reason I said that I, how fortunate I feel to have lived with the program when I did, in history, shake, 
500 years from now, I personally believe there's only one thing they're going to be remembering about the 20th century, and that's that man landed on the moon. Wow. Yeah. I, uh, I, I hate to take exception to that because 500 years from now, now there may have been an eagle that landed on the moon in 1969, but I can assure you there will be an eagle that lands on Mars. And that, in my estimation, will not be a short visit for occupying it. But when we really think about it, it will be a permanent settlement. Now that doesn't mean that in a thousand years or so, we may decide, gee, that's just too rough living out there for all these people. We've learned enough about Mars. Maybe we really ought to start scuba diving on Europa or Enceladus. So forget about Mars. That's possible, but I really think that humanity will move and permanently, for the time being, settle on Mars and people will go there and they will spend the rest of their life. I know this is not an easy thing to come to grips with, but I think that is our destiny. And when you look at the cost of sending people there, and the cost of bringing them back and losing two years, and you keep doing that, and you look at the cost that adds up of sending people to Mars and bringing them back. And when you do that, if you keep uh, it occupied, there still is a steady state number 30, 60, that's a maximum. And the loss of the legacy of a leader of the world to have made that commitment to prepare the surface of Mars by preparing and practicing at the moon exactly what we will be doing at Mars and then going there and living and staying, landing and staying. That is a legacy that I doubt that any world leader, when they fully understand it and realize that that's capable for us to do, even if no one by this time in 2025 has even gone back and landed on the moon, it's my prediction that a world leader will make that commitment to land and stay. Jim? Let me give everybody a thought that is a little bit different than anything that you have heard today or really thought about the missions that we did. On Apollo 8, of course, we saw the Earth as it really is now, just one small body in a rather large void of the solar system and the universe. Think about this for a second. We all think about, I hope to go to heaven when I die. I hope to go to heaven when I die. Ladies and gentlemen, you go to heaven when you're born. You arrive on a planet with the, the amount of the, the positive mass that provides the gravity that contains water and an atmosphere. 
the essentials for life. You arrive on a planet that is orbiting in a star just to the right distance, not too far out to be too cold, in too far in to be too hot, just to the right distance to be able to absorb that star's energy, energy that caused life to evolve here in the beginning. So just think about that. God has really given us, or given mankind, I should say, a stage that we saw out there for us to perform. How that play turns out is up to us. Yeah. Um, can't disagree with what you say, Jim. Uh, this is a little bit of heaven down here, isn't it? Uh, it's too bad we can't all get together and make the best of it. Um, I, happen, I happen to believe that um, uh, it's going to be great to go to Mars, but I think we're going to have to go a lot further than that. Um, I think we're going to have to go out to the point where we find another uh, habitable planet, like we're in here. Uh, and, and, and that's kind of based on some sort of basic stuff. Uh, for instance, I could ask the question, what is the prime imperative of everything that's alive here on Earth? And I think you'd have to respond to that by saying it's survival of the species. That is the prime imperative of everything that's alive here on Earth, including people. And if we uh, really have a, a prime imperative of survival of the species, uh, then we've got to develop the capability of taking care of ourselves when we can't live here on the Earth anymore. And that might be five billion years out, but you know it's like the old Chinese axiom, or 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 saying that uh, a trip of a thousand years starts with one step. And I think we made the step at the moon. The next step is going to be Mars, or 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 maybe the next two or three steps will be Mars. Uh, but we're going to have to go out way beyond that to find a place where we can live when when humanity can't live here anymore. The other heaven, Gene, if you will. Last thoughts. No, I better not give an opinion there. <laughs> you know, listening to this thing, I classified uh, people as poets and plumbers. Well, I'm one of the plumbers. Do you have a copy of my book? Ladies and gentlemen, the men of Apollo. Thanks, Al. Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, God. Thank you, Buzz. Thanks. We got through it. Thanks, Fred. That was great. Thanks, sir. Yeah, see you in the morning. You too, man. Thank you, Walt. Thank you, Dean. That was fabulous. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah. Only in theater in the woods, right? Thanks for coming. Air Force fighter pilot flew the F-100 and went to the test pilot school at Edwards. He is the youngest American astronaut flying the X-15 at age 32. He was backup crews for two Apollo flights, but also flew CAP Commander 2 STS uh, shuttle missions and is the only shuttle commander to pilot the shuttle from orbit to full stop landing at Edwards manually. This is retired Major General Joe Engel. You outrank everybody.
And the poor guys whose name, last name, ends in W get stuck all the time. Darn it. West Point graduate, graduate engineer, degrees, interceptor, test pilot, flew Apollo 15, a retired Air Force colonel, Al Worden. Al? Yeah. Oh, we've got too many chairs here. So you know what? Maybe we can spread out. Yeah, we, yeah, spread out a little bit. It looks like, yeah, yeah. Huh? <laughs> Wait, you can separate. So, you know, if you like the guy next to you, you can sit next to him. If not, you can, you know. <laughs> Gene, sitting down at the far end there. Start us off, would you? You know, we see so many um, newsreel you know, the highlights of all the Apollo and all the Gemini missions, but we never or rarely talk about what it takes to get to become an astronaut. We hear some of the background, but Gene, criteria, what kind of criteria? I mean, they're all great aviators to begin with, but what is, what is NASA looking for besides great pilots? I think the first thing they want to do is uh, find one of these uh, astronauts that are going to respond to a flight director. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, if that doesn't work, I turn the surgeon on them. <laughs> but you know, but actually, actually the, uh, the training process in the early days was very interesting. You have to really uh, go back into the late 50s, early 60s, and uh, address how did, we, how did we train the crews, how did we train the controllers. You know, the uh, simulator that the Mercury astronauts had was basically what you would say a procedures trainer. It had basically a series of switches in there that represented the, what's inside the cockpit. And basically, they provided an indication when they're flipped to an instructor at the console. So this was basically a procedures trainer. There was virtually nothing that you could do related to the mission except for the crew to follow the flight plan. Uh, the instructor at the console would do this. In the meantime, in Mercury Control, basically we had a, what we call a sim soup. It was very early days. And as the spacecraft would theoretically go around the world, various sites would have seen it, he'd run around, pass his pieces of paper out. And it'd go to the surgeon that says, uh, your astronaut just had a heart attack. And we try to, uh, surgeon would now fake it. What would he do if he had a sick astronaut in orbit? So basically the, uh, the uh, process was extremely rudimentary. It was uh, typical, I think, of the uh, early jet fighters they had in there, where basically you spent a lot of time in a cockpit, and basically you got your flight plan, you knew your procedures, and you uh, basically applied the throttle and started moving forward. So that was, that was Mercury. Uh, Walt, um, even though you're all, you're all pilots, in terms of training, you're a Marine, so you went through particularly difficult early training, I assume. <laughs> Once a Marine, always a Marine. Yes, sir. Understood. Um, but how was the training process for you, given what you would already been through in training, um, for you to become an astronaut to be accepted? Well, back in the days when I was flying, at the time I came to NASA, I was flying with the reserves because I decided I ought to go to college when I was 24 years old. So I was started college there, and I was flying with the reserves, and. Uh, I don't think I, with this audience, I ought to give exactly my reaction when I was listening to uh, Alan Shepard's first liftoff. But uh, I wanted to be a, a fighter pilot, which I was felt quite successful at being. And uh, it was after Alan Shepard's first liftoff, May 5th, 1961. And, uh, well, I will tell the story. Uh, at that time, I was. Uh, working half-time at the Rand Corporation, going to UCLA, lived in Canoga Park, had to go over to Santa Monica every morning because I was trying to earn a living. Uh, back in those days, we did not get free college and all that. Ooh. And uh, I was listening, it was a little before seven, I was listening to the countdown of uh, the first Mercury mission. And when it got down to the last five minutes, I could not go any farther. I pulled over and parked at the side of the road on Mulholland Drive. And I'll never forget, got down to three, two, one, 
liftoff, and I heard, heard this voice screaming out here, you lucky, what, well, SOB. I, I just cut it short. And I was, first I was looking around to see who it was, and I realized it was me <laughs> doing that screaming. And that was when I decided what I was going to be trying to do. And two years later, I was, uh, I was sharing, two and a half years later, I was sharing an office with Alan Shepard. Wow. Wow. Frank Borman, Frank Man, how was, how was the training process for you uh, once you were selected as an astronaut um, to be then selected to actually fly? How tough was the process, or not? Well, it, was, it really wasn't that difficult, but it was uh, involved an awful lot of learning. We spent. Uh, uh, you hear me now? It, we we uh, we spent an awful lot of time at the different factories, and uh, we went to uh, academic courses and so on. But it was it was uh, basically a a, uh, a course in immersing yourself in a new a new industry. At least uh, for me, it was new rockets. I don't know if you guys have been around rockets before. I never had been around them. Right. So, Al. Even though you got W, right? I'm always last. Yeah, you poor guy. Um, but W, how was the process for you in adapting after the flying career? Um, it really wasn't a very big transition. I was uh, teaching at the test pilot school at Edwards. I had gone through the Empire Test Pilot School in England. Um, I w worked for a guy by the name of Chuck Yeager, uh, who was a rather interesting individual. Um, and uh, Bob Buchanan was the uh, deputy, uh, and uh, Jay Hanks, Norris Hanks, was the head of academics there. Uh, when I got selected into the program, oh, I have to tell you, the first thing that happened is that I got assigned to Wally Schirra. And uh, Wally was a captain in the Navy, and I was a captain in the Air Force, and I went in and, and let him know that we were both captains, and so I really didn't have to worry about what he had to say. And, and, <laughs> And I found, out, I, f I found out that I was very quickly sweeping his floor and getting him coffee uh, because, because that's what happens to greenies. That's what happens to newbies at, uh, in, down in Houston. Uh, we, we weren't worth much until we made a flight. Uh, but I didn't see a lot of transition for me because one of the first things we did was we got checked out in T-38, so we started flying. And then we went through a classroom session of about six months and after that, got signed to an engineering program uh, on Apollo 9. And of course, when we had the fire at the Cape, I was on the recovery engineering group at the manufacturer. And so there was a lot of engineering to do, and that would have been the kind of engineering I would have done anywhere. So it was only after all of that that I really saw some differences. Uh, I got assigned to uh, Apollo 12 backup and then Apollo 15 prime crew, and it was uh, quite different. Well, Gene Kranz, in the, in the video, uh, I talked about the fact that each mission was built on the successes and lessons learned from the mission before. How much was learned from Mercury leading into Gemini and how successful was that? No one can really remember how many years ago it was before most of them were here again. It's in the 20s. I was here. They were fun last time. They're absolutely fantastic tonight. Here they are! David Hartman. Headlines in the newsreels. It would be good to hear some of the background stuff. Oh, here I am. Oh. I'm late. I'm late. Hey, that is a tough act to follow, the Blue Angels. <laughs> Holy cow. Anyway, good evening, everybody. Uh, to start our Apollo evening. Um, attention to the big screen, please. And here's a little backgrounder on the space program from the 1960s. Yeah. If you want to watch the screen. I can see it from here. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not and because they are easy, this. but because they are hard. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for man. Yeah, we've had a problem here. Can say again, please? Oh, uh, here's we've had a problem. Stand by it. 
13, we're looking at it. used to having thousands of man-made satellites zooming around our planet. About 1,100 of them are active now. But until 1957, there was no such thing as a man-made satellite. That's when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, they called it, into orbit. It was 184 pounds, a little bigger than a beach ball, and as it zoomed around the Earth, all it did was beep. And that beep told the world, we, the Soviets, are first in space and we beat the United States in getting there. Then four years later, in 1961, the Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human to orbit the Earth. And one month later, Alan Shepard became the first American in space. The space race was on. In April 1961, just a few months after he was inaugurated, President Kennedy challenged America. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. One of the original astronauts, Wally Schirra, was fond of saying, quote, the most important part of the president's statement was returning him safely to Earth, end quote. At the time, it seemed impossible to get to the moon, but the entire country was behind it, and the United States ramped up fast. There were three programs, six one-man flights called Mercury, then ten two-man flights called Gemini, and finally, 11 three-man flights called Apollo. Each flight had new challenges and unknowns, and each flight built on the knowledge learned from the earlier flights. Just eight and a half years... ...that process to get to the two-man flights in Gemini. I think the transition was uh, relatively smooth. We had experienced crews coming out of the Mercury program that generally were the mission commanders, the commanders that moved into the Gemini program. So then they moved the fact that some of the newer astronauts in there. By this time, however, the simulation process had really expanded almost exponentially. We had basically systems that could fully represent uh, the spacecraft systems. We had basically computers a very simple computer on board the Gemini spacecraft, about a 4K machine. But basically this now provided the astronauts information as to some of the things that were happening to them once they got on orbit. Uh, I believe that the, uh, the real breakthrough in training occurred during the process of simulation because now we had an instrument that would basically complement the classroom and the learn by doing because we all spent a lot of time in the factories, uh, working the procedures, down at the Cape with range safety and all that. So basically it was a combination to learn by doing, okay, and then it, take that and apply it during the simulation training process you had. So those first Gemini missions, including Ed White, what was that, Gemini 4? Gemini 4. 4 it was the first EVA. But those first few Gemini missions, how successful were they uh, leading up to what we're going to talk about in a moment with Gemini 7? Well, Gemini 4 was the uh, EVA I wrote the uh, procedures, actually, uh, I got a call because that was my first mission as flight director. And uh, Kraft called up and says, are you ready for your flight director? He says, yeah. He says, that's good. He says, because we'd like to do an EVA. Ed White's been in training over in the uh, uh, 
laboratories over there with some of the equipment they had. And what I want you to do is go over and basically get fully knowledgeable of the equipment he's using, what are the tasks he's trying to do, what are the kinds of limitations they got when you apply it within the spacecraft. Uh, and basically it was just to sit down and talk yourself through what you were trying to do and then try to translate that into procedure. And we had a marvelous crew systems division with absolutely superb engineers that were providing the hardware. So again, it was one of these things, you know, at that time, risk was virtually everything we did, but basically we became adept and good managers of the process of the missions we flew and basically controlling the risk associated. What happened with six that led to seven that Frank and Jim flew? What happened with six that, that allowed seven to happen? Frank or Jim, you want to grab that? Jim? Well, of course, what happened is six that uh, uh, permitted a lot of different things to happen, which was sometimes the way to go was the fact that six was all set to do the first rendezvous. And uh, the, uh, it was, uh, uh, what was it? it was, uh, oh, it was uh, uh, Frank, what, no. Well, uh, Gina, but who was in the six? The, Puzzle, Robert, Stafford. Stafford and Shalom, that's right. Stafford and... I apologize when I'm just getting old. <laughs> We're the same age. <laughs> anyway, uh, with Stafford and Shalom were going up at six, and, uh, uh, and the Gina was launched. The Gina was lost, and so uh, they had to recycle. And here's where good management came into play. Uh, seven was going to be a two-week mission. <clears throat> so can we recycle Apollo or Gemini 6 to go rendezvous with seven? Now, seven did not have a docking uh, device on it, but can we just, you know, prove out the rendezvous? So that's exactly what they did. We were up for about uh, eight days, I think, at the time. And then, then there was a second attempt to launch, and uh, the engines ignited uh, on, on the vehicle and then shut down right away. Fortunately, uh, Wally Schwab was a little slow in doing the aborts and, <laughs> and consequently everything was fine. And so I think on day 12 of our flight, uh, six took off and did the rendezvous. And so we accomplished that rendezvous uh, by good management and, and seeing how we can get uh, Gemini six up with seven. Years after the Kennedy Challenge, Neil Armstrong became the first human to walk on the moon. There were 30 Apollo astronauts, 12 of them walked on the moon. Most agree that this was the greatest single scientific human achievement in history. It was accomplished by hundreds of thousands of dedicated Americans, patriots, brilliant engineers, scientists and managers, academics and technicians, and of course, risk-taking aviator astronauts. Odyssey Houston standing by, over. Odyssey Houston, we show you on the main, it really looks great. So welcome our panelists. Our first guest tonight is actually the only one who's not an astronaut. Aerospace engineer, a retired Air Force F-86 pilot, flight director and manager for Gemini and most of the Apollo flights. He is a huge part and the heart and the soul of the space program. Welcome Gene Kranz.
Next, he's a marine fighter pilot and physicist. Worked for many years as a civilian at the RAND Corporation. Apollo 7, the first manned Apollo flight. Retired Marine Colonel Walt Cunningham. Annapolis graduate, naval aviator, attack pilot, test pilot, flew two Gemini missions and two Apollo missions. Retired Navy captain, Jim Lovell. West Point graduate, Air Force fighter pilot, test pilot, master's degree in aeronautical engineering, flew Gemini 7 and Apollo 8, Air Force retired Colonel Frank Borman. <laughs> Air Force and Navy fighter pilot, both engineer, research test pilot for NASA, flew Apollo 13, Fred Hayes. Another West Point graduate, Air Force fighter pilot, has a PhD from MIT in astronautics, flew Gemini 12 and Apollo 11, Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> 